So uh, welcome back, Paul. Uh, tonight we're going to explore stress, uh, its place in Aikido, um, uh, what it means, and then explore how we might deal with stress off the mat, because I reckon we're practicing to deal with it on the mat. So let's make the transition from on the mat to off the mat, which seems like a really good follow on from what Patrick and Rich and, and uh, Jack did last week. Um, Okay, so I always like to start these sessions with uh, a dictionary definition because then Paul can't, can't, can't leap on me if I uh, don't define it right to his, his liking. Uh, and the Cambridge Dictionary is the one I always use. So it says stress is great worry caused by a difficult situation or something that causes this condition. Um, so I'm just going to pass that to you for a Paul for a second and say, would you like to refine that definition in terms of what you're going to share with us tonight. I would like to di di dispute it, but I'll, I'll work my way up to that. But I do want to start with a question. Okay. The Beatles, one of the Beatles' early songs was about a lizard. What song was that? Uh, Could you repeat the question, please? Sure. One of the Beatles' early songs was about a lizard. Which song was that? We're all uh, stunned. I don't remember. Iguana, hold your hand. Uh oh! Groan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling stressed true. already. <laughs> I'm feeling stressed already. I know I that would do it. It takes a certain degree of something to not be stressed by a joke like that. It, it, <laughs> I think okay. that's probably true. Um, firstly, let's just uh, see what place stress has in Aikido. So uh, would everybody agree that perhaps the point of the practice is to put your system under stress by being faced by violence and learn no. how to deal with that? No and yes. Okay, you're, that's one vote. What about others? Oh, so, so? You can offer some views. It's better than, than just the wiggle of the fingers. It's certainly got to take you out of your comfort zone. I think so. I mean, I think the whole point is to stretch your boundaries. Um, so you may not start with somebody coming at you with a sword on day one, but someone just grabbing you can be very stressful for some uh, or trying to push or pull. Sean. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to distinguish perhaps between the point of practice and the point of the practice, right? So like O-sensei makes it very clear that the point of Aikido is to help you realize your, like your tenmei, your heavenly mission, right? And to complete or perfect uh, the creation, the continuing ongoing creation of the universe. Like that's the point of Aikido, right? But of course the point of practice, right? I would then agree, yes, absolutely, but we get stressed and we become more resilient. And so mm. just to distinguish between the point of the yep. practice. No, good distinguish. Uh, the point of oh, practice. David's shaking yeah. his head. So uh, come on, David, speak up. Well, I would just say that I, mean, I would say I actually I used Aikido as a massive stress reliever. So I found it actually a lot less stressful doing Aikido than going to work. So I, I didn't, for me, Aikido is not stressful in the slightest. I'd okay. Rather. So from that point of view, I, I don't, so I, I understand it pushing boundaries, but even then it's not really pushing boundaries that hard, I don't think. Okay, so the first time somebody, you, you went onto the mat, did you feel comfortable with it then? Yeah, very, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, there you go. I, I spent that, Liz. Yeah. Uh, when, when I think about when I've been sort of felt stressed in the dojo, the uh, input from the teacher is actually very important. You know, most Aikido teachers create a safe environment to practice in, yep. but not all of them. And some of them, just being on the mat with them is stressful. True. Uh, I think, yeah, that is, that is a good point. Um, I'm going to come back to what, what Sean was saying, that as part of the practice, you're always looking to push your boundaries and extend to the point where you, you can be comfortable and you can give your best performance. 
and you know that's why we start with a static practice and we move on to movement and that becomes rapid movement and then you know all out basically we're always looking to push those boundaries and and be able to cope with uh, a greater level of pressure and if you don't feel any pressure david that that's fantastic but i think for many they do and we use a uh, physical attack as because for many people that is the a biggest stressor that, yeah, that's just to follow on, just in some ways, it's because it's I'm more curious and it, I see it as more being fun than, than stressful. And right. I mean, the, the, being attacked by a knife or a bokken or a thing, I find less stressful than some really annoying hookies, to be honest. But um, so, yeah, anyway. Well, it takes, it takes all sorts, doesn't it? So, I mean, it's totally valid what you're saying. Sean, did you want to say something? Well, I... I, th I think that, you know, a stress, stress could be like a positive thing, right? Like the Ooh. pressure of seeing a dear friend you haven't trained with in a long time could produce a certain social pressure and stress to, oh, it's so good to see you, but this might take you off focus from the practice, right? So like something like this could be a stress, which is not a negative stress. It's a very pleasant, fun, enjoyable stress, right? But it's something which challenges your focus. Okay. Um, no, I, I, it, it sort of fits in the same general. Um, well, you've reminded me of something I wanted to do at the beginning of the session. So you, you know that on other sessions, I've given you a word and I said, is it a positive or is it a negative for you? And, and usually that leads people to go, give me a long stream of, well, it could be this, it could be that and a whole week, but I'm only going to allow you to say one word, positive or negative. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, when you think of stress, you have to say positive or negative. Steve. Is stress positive or negative? Uh, positive. Okay, Paul. Yes. Is that a positive? No, I said yes. It no, I know, but you have to say positive <laughs> or negative. I said yes, it is positive and negative. A covering his back. <laughs> Richard. Both. Gordon. Yeah, I, I would say both. Vitaly. It's more negative for me personally with my kind of disease. Just one Any word. Oh, okay. Just one word. I, I would go with both. Joanna. Both. Sean. Got reaction negative. Patrick. Ooh. Both. Alec. Uh, both. Liz. Both. Linda. Both mostly negative. Hugh. Negative. David. Negative. Judith. Negative. Demetra. Both. Only one word, even though you're muted. Uh, <laughs> Patrick. Oh, well, when you come back, Patrick, maybe. I'm going to give you your full name, Sharima. Um, before I answer, can you just let me... Uh, I'm just going to switch to my laptop. Can you let me in again? Yes, um, I can. And, uh, it's mostly... Oh, sorry. It's one word, isn't it? Uh, positive. Okay. I, I think... I, I personally think that you're, you're using your mind when you say both, because I think intellectually it is. And I think if you didn't have stress, you don't you don't get a chance to grow. I think it's a really can be positive from that sense. But I think most of us don't enjoy the thought of being stressed. And I think gut wise, most people would say negative. And no, and most people here, if the, if they came off the fence, did say that. So um, I think it can though it has a positive aspect to it, uh, and that, and I think that's that's part of the power of our practice. At this point, Paul, I'm going to pass across to you. Okay. I think as Aikiruists or other kinds of movement people, we all have had experience of many different styles of stress management. I'd like to start by pointing in our thoughts in a very different direction. What is the purpose of Aikido? We've already talked about that. And I disagree totally. Aikido has no purpose. Oh, Sensei had a purpose in creating and using Aikido. What's the purpose of a hammer? I usually use that as an example. What would you say? The purpose of a hammer is to pound nails, right? No, the, the hammer has no purpose. 
a conscious being has a purpose and then he builds the hammer to fulfill that purpose. You see what I'm saying? So is the purpose of Aikido to allow us to deal with stress? That can be your purpose and it may be somebody else's purpose and it may not be somebody else's else's purpose. What, what was my purpose in telling that terrible joke about the iguana? I just love it, so I won't tell it again. <laughs> but, we uh, love it too. <laughs> good. So what is, when you say stress, one of the things that I wonder about is, let's, let's take something else, a, a fl flower, the word flower, like a, a garden flower, a pansy or something. Is that a noun or a verb, that, that word? Pansy. Yeah. Is it a noun or a verb? Sure. Is that a noun or a verb? It's a noun. Right. Okay. Are emotions objects or processes? Processes. It's a process. Pardon? Processes, I think. Right. Okay. Then why do we use nouns to refer to them? I think part of what gives us difficulty in dealing with stress, mm -hmm. or we, that might be so far, is that our language, the English language, points us in the wrong direction. One day years ago, I was walking by a pond in the spring. I saw the pollen from the pine, pine tree drifting down onto the pond and the wind was rippling the pond. And all of a sudden I found myself saying, the winding is blowing the pollening onto the ponding. You get why I said that, what it meant. There was nothing solid, nothing permanent. It was all movement. But we use nouns, the wind, not much nounish in a wind, is there? Was blowing the pollen, not much nounish there either, onto the pond. That's even less nounish. But if you think in terms of nouns, you get directed towards objects. That's what we think of. So what is stress? Is stress a process or a, an object? Process. I agree. Process, yes. Okay. I Maybe. think it depends, Paul. I think. Uh, if it's happen if you're describing what's going on in your body, I am stressed. It's a process. Oh, I am. That, if you're talking about the thing that is causing the stress, there is nothing. You don't get stressed. You do stress. And that's the that's the problem I want to point at. If if I step on your pet cat, I ground it, grind it into the carpet. Does that make you mad? It would make me murderous. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> you would make yourself murderous about what I did. Get the difference? Yeah. The language says, I am in control of your emotions. I grind your pet cat into the carpet, and that makes you murderous. Mm. <laughs> this stresses you out. Mm -hmm. That gives you the feeling that it's that that's in control of you. And if you think that way, it often is. See where I'm going? Yes. I would like to change the language to say, I do stress, I do anger at you. You don't make me angry. That would be a permanent reminder that it's we who are doing it, that in our own bodies. Oh, I mean? yeah, I, I do. That, that's just made a thought pop into my mind. No, um, you got it. Yeah, this is really about <laughs> Alex, so I think I'll let him explain. But this thing about stress being within the body, it can be physically generated by the body from no external cause. So Alec had a pituitary tumour, which played havoc with his um, hormones and thing. You get very stressed. And of course, you then develop a whole, before you know what the cause is, you develop a whole narrative around what the external stresses are that are causing it. But none of that was true. What was actually causing it was a tumour on his pituitary gland. When it got cut out, mag a magical result. Yeah, physiological oh. process. It was a physiological, entirely physiologically driven. This is a physiological process too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But. but. But see that I can, I can still it. I wow. Can't same time yet but yeah i could i could shed tremors and then i can't say anything but you want me to talk so i have to shake while i talk that's really impressive what you've just done 
Well, it took me a while to figure out how, mm. but I can now, I can st stop it and, and rest for whenever I need to. Am I stressed or am I stressing? Does it come in or, does it, or do I generate it? See what I'm saying? It's a very mm. different use of the, word, of the way the, the language works. Now, I don't know about other languages. I only speak a few others, and they all are all in the same pattern as English. But, um, okay. If I pop a balloon, does that stress you? It stresses Joanna. No, it doesn't. She stresses herself <laughs> about it. So I'm getting, it's, a very, it's a very cumbersome, very strange way to speak, but it's more accurate. And it's more, it doesn't matter normally. But if you're trying to take control over what you're doing in your body and you keep on being directed over there, you're not focusing on your body. You're right, but I think there are, there, there are, there are levels of humanity where, um, so for instance, when, when I had, I, my nephew was really, really young, uh, the, in the Christmas crackers, there was a set of uh, sort of vampire fangs and I put them in my mouth and I smiled at him and he was absolutely frozen rigid with fear. Uh, and that oh. was a learned thing. That was the first time he'd ever seen anything like it, but he was I, I pretty say genuinely it was terrified. Yeah, I didn't say it was learned, did I? No, but it, I, I think you're suggesting there's a measure of control over it, which, you know, we're going to get on to, but I'm just yeah, saying that in some instances, it's, it, it's just a response in your body. Yes, that's true. And there is no measure of control over it unless you have tools. Mm. Can you fly like a bird? I can fly. I, can. I flew to London a few years ago, but I used an airplane. <laughs> what I'm trying to suggest is we can use our, our, our intellect to create technology, which will enable us to do things that we can't normally do. So if you don't have the tool, it's not practically, practically it is not true that you can control it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't control my tremors. So I figured out how. That is amazing. My father had Parkinson's. That's amazing. I'm sure. The one thing that cheers me in another 20 years, I won't tremor at all, one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Quentin, it struck me because we, we, people do react completely differently. You know, th different things stress different people, don't they? So it is an internal process because something that stresses one person won't even be noticed by the next. And yeah. in dealing with noise complaints, you get this all the time, don't you? That, yeah. Like kids, you want to say? Yeah. Uh, we, I see how people react to yeah. the same uh, stimulus, if I can use that word, yes. in different ways. Within um, limits, there are similar and within limits, there are different possibilities. But what yeah. I'm trying to do is interrupt at you guys and say, don't use forbidden language. Don't say. I was trying very hard not to. Yeah. <laughs> so I say stimulus. Yeah. yeah. Rather right. than stressing. So the classic thing is like. Do stress. It's like the noise of kids playing in somebody's back garden. Now that never annoys me. It would. Um, I, I actually find that a pleasant sound. But he gets frequent noise complaints by people who can't bear the sound of kids playing in neighbouring gardens, and it's an issue, isn't it? They don't have the tools to bear it, and they haven't chosen <laughs> to use those tools. Yeah. And I did, I totally agree with all everything you're saying. It's normal English speaking. But my experience is that if you speak normally, it makes it harder to do un abnormal things. Yeah. Okay. So I do want to get on to how you deal with this shit. But I first <laughs> want to have some <laughs> so that I can speak. And it, it means the same thing when it enters your ears that it means when, I, when it leaves my mouth. Do you guys see the point? I'm, a word, so. I'm a word pest, but I mm. like it. Mm. Okay. So what about a stimulus do people find stressful? Do people do stress at? Many possibilities. What, what kinds of things do you experience or see other people? In his case, it's it's noise. How people react to different noise. To, to, noises <laughs> not upset me at all. No, that's not good word. Just laugh back at you. But you know, he has complaints every day coming in at work 
from people who get upset about all sorts of noises that, frankly, I wouldn't even notice. And then we get people who complain you know? about the fact they can't get to sleep at night because the neighbours playing music. The stimulus is different, but the, and the reaction it's always different, is always it's different. Always different. There are some commonalities among all the stress reactions. I, if you think about it as being a spectrum, from minor irritation to being tortured to death, are it, those, would, those extremes would seem to be very different from, from each other, right? But the commonality is a, a, a collapsing or compressing, or a collapsing or constricting of attention, breath, movement, posture, thought, everything. I made up the word smallify because I couldn't find an English word that is indistinguishably about getting tensely small or getting collapsed and limply small. And I'm not talking about one or the other, I'm talking about smallness as such. So that I think the common reaction, the commonality in all the different reactions to stress or whatever that's negative challenges is a tightening or, or limp, limpifying, if I may do that. You see what I'm getting at? Once you've identified the common commonality in all the responses, then you can craft a tool which works well to rele release, to open the body. And that is a way of starting to deal with the stressful stimuli. Now let's well, well, uh, what, what, Sorry, what you're saying uh, implies that you can measure it in some way when it's happening and sense it. Yes. The, the re yeah, the reason I answered Quentin negative to stress was from a purely medical point of view. Stress is a dangerous thing. How much? And, and, and the reason it's dangerous is most often is because you don't realize what's going on. You can't measure it. You don't notice it until it explodes into something else. Right. And the, 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 the teaching is to learn how to notice it early. Yeah, I had a client who had been terribly abused, and her coping strategy was to reduce her awareness. She she smallified her awareness. And at one point, I asked her, "If you drive on the freeway with your eyes shut, they cannot hit you because they can't see you, right?" And she agreed. That is a non-helpful coping strategy, right? I think you'd agree. But people do respond that way. They get small because they can't think of anything else. They don't have those mm -hmm. tools. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, I've always noticed if I'm stressed about something is that that's almost the only thing. Stress, yeah, that's it. Stressing. Stressing. I'm stressing about something. It's the only thing my brain will want to think about. It, it just it starts to exclude everything else. Yeah. Why is that useful? It isn't well, very useful. Well, well, yes, exactly. Survival, an evolutionary adaptation to deal with a particular danger, perhaps. Or, or any gen general danger. If you're going through the woods and you're rustling and you shoot, <laughs> yeah. you wait for it, it could be a chipmunk. That's cool. Chipmunks are cute. And it could be a tiger. And if you survive the tiger, you won't wait to see if it's a chipmunk the next time. You'll run like hell. <laughs> it's a little bit of a rustling. So that is that response, all that response to stress is a waste of energy nine times and it saves your life the tenth. It's evolutionary, evolutionarily useful. So I think we have to distinguish between things that are useful in certain contexts and the way we misapply them now, there's billions of us and very few tigers left. Yeah. Okay. So you see where I'm trying to go? I'm trying to clear the field so we can speak about what we want without giving ourselves messages to go that away, to go in two directions at once. Okay. Um, let me think. Any questions while I'm pondering? So why do you say so go in two directions at once? Do you mean allowing the possibility of moving in any direction or do you literally mean moving in two directions at once? I mean, literally, if you try to go, if you try to reduce, well, there's a great slogan in the 60s. Fighting for peace is like fucking for chastity. 
If you go in the one direction, <laughs> you go in the other. You see, you, you have to choose which you're going to go in. And if you want to go in two directions, they're incompatible, you'll be screwed, technically speaking. Sure. Okay, um, there was something else. What was I trying to think of? Yes, okay. Responsibility. That's what I'm talking about, the ability to respond. And you, you have to cultivate that because if you don't, you won't have it. So if you have the ability, but you don't know you have it and don't have the tools to do, to do anything with it, you might as well not have it at all. So what, what do you do when you feel stressed? What, what, um, what's the opposite of stress? Relaxation. Relaxing. Relaxing. Calmnessing. Calmnessing. You're 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 walking down the train tracks because it's nice and you've gone for a walk. You look up and there's a train coming. You relax. <laughs> and you step off the tracks. That's not what you said. You said relax. <laughs> <laughs> because you go. You can't. If you're a train that. spotter, you might feel very relaxed and just step off the tracks calmly. So it yes. depends how quickly you can respond. True. But what I'm pointing out is the opposite of stress is not just relaxation. It's relaxation so you can do something about the situation in which you feel the stress often. So it's not enough to say relax, as though many people know what to do when they hear that. But you also have to tell them what to do next. So, so if so if you're feeling hot, you might be stressed about you might be stressing about that. And an appropriate reaction might be to take your jumper off or it might be to get out of the house because it's on fire. Exactly. But you don't want to just relax, you'd be cooked. <laughs> so so the point for me and my keto practice, or one of the key things I'm trying to get across to students when I'm training them, is that you you're trying to get to a place where you see things for what oh, you really are. Oh, it's sorry, Alex, got to go and rescue a live mouse. Okay, we don't want that sort of stress in this session. Thank you, Liz. Um, uh, the mouse has just gone under oh, the sofa. Don't, don't give it up. Oh, uh, <laughs> I'm going to leave you with your mouse and mute you for now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, yeah, it's, it's that rather than reacting to a situation, you actually see it for what it is so that you can come up with an appropriate response. Now that might be to flee the burning house or it might be to take your jumper off. Or it might be both or to put the fire out, anything you wish. Yeah, as long as it's appropriate. Yeah, appropriate depends partly on what the person wishes, but yes, you have to do something. If you're just stressed about something that has no particular doing to it, you're worried that Santa Claus might crash when he goes down the chimney. There's nothing you can do about that. So you stop the, the doing of it in your body. But if it's your grandmother who's driving and she doesn't have her glasses, then there is something you can do about that. And you do something, you don't just relax and say, well, I hope grandma gets here. You get her glasses. So I think there's different kinds and situations of stress. But much of what we stress about is stuff that we can do something about. If you're not relaxed, you can't do it well or at all perhaps. But if you're only relaxed, you get hit by the train. You see why I started with language. I think it's very important to know what the language points us at because if it points us in the wrong direction, we'll never go in the other direction as well. So if smallifying is a crucial piece of all stress responses, what do you suspect I would suggest as the, the beginning of undoing that response? Bigifying. Bigifying, yes, good. I don't use that word. There's an English word expanding, expansive. I, I tend to use that. Bigifying is good. I, it matches smallifying quite well. But yes, how do you how do you expand? How do you bigify? Can I, can I just suggest isn't there a step before that you've got to recognize that you're smallifying? Pardon? You're, I you've got to recognize know. that you are smallifying. That's the first step, surely. Yeah. You actually notice what's going on with you and how you're doing stress. 
Right, mm -hmm. exactly. You have to, and that's where the practice comes in. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, guys, we're back. Alex caught the mouse and put it outside. It was a very stressed wood mouse. But or it was a stressing wood mouse. A stressing wood mouse, but it's in one piece. <laughs> and it was stressed. Like, it, 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 well, judging by that cat, I can understand why. So. <laughs> so, but back to the old sort of, yeah. uh, you know, being caught in the jungle, hearing the rustle of the tiger. I think we've just had a good example of that. I'd bring the mouse back. He could learn some useful stuff here. Yeah, yeah uh, well, you missed it because it was in a... Uh -huh. I did show it in, in, in its glass, but never mind. It's outside getting de getting de-stressing now. I okay. Back to you, Paul. I was graduate school for teaching rat, rats Aikido. And the first rat that I taught this to, I took home and I put him on the floor and my two cats advanced on him. And he, he ran straight at them, backed them into a corner, and then they snuffled noses and they ate out of the same dish for the rest of the rat's life. So <laughs> I, I had clearly taught the rat something. But uh, it, it's not necessarily the case that the tiger doesn't, that the tiger wins. Sometimes the mouse mm. does. Mm. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. It's a long time ago. Now I can teach that very much more efficiently. Okay, so what do you do to bigify, to open your body? There's a million ways you can do it. What I try to do is to start deliberately with, it, with that precisely as an action. Have you ever been a firefly's butt. That's one I like. Have you ever been a light, a light bulb or a candle or something that shines, glows, and opens? Probably not. But if you pretended you're a candle, what would you feel in your flame as the light goes out, outward? If you think of your body as the candle flame and you shut your eyes and you, 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 you image not as a picture, but as a feeling in the body. Image the light radiating outwards in all directions from your body. Does anything change in your body? That's really. What, what do you feel? Expansion. And how does, can you tell us more about how that feels? Is it good well, or bad? Well, it's the space inside and around the body and the awareness of the space expands. You yeah. feel more um, expansion of space around you, spacious, yeah. it's spaciousness. Yes, that is the beginning of being able to control the stress response. It's the opposite, the antidote. Does everybody feel something of that sort? Yeah, yes. Um, so you chose an image there that, that sort of outward, if you like. Yeah. Uh, not everyone's going to relate to that. You might have to use different pictures, but have you ever had anybody who just couldn't do that, that it didn't change anything for them. No, I haven't. And part of that is I pick my language level very carefully. As I said, extend key to the ends of the universe. I have hardly anybody who could do that because it isn't common English. Nobody knows what it is when they start. You have to start with the language that the students understand and gradually build up their experience until their language becomes weird and then they can speak Aikido with us but I've never had anybody who couldn't. Well, I have had people who are afraid to because they were hiding and their feeling was if I, if I shrink, they won't find me and hit me again. And then I show them how to open up and they can quite easily. And then I have to show them that though when they're open, they can hit and protect themselves. And then I've ch changed the, the stimulus, the, the meaning of the, the stimulus to them. I had one student who was battered as a child, seriously. One day he came in and I was teaching him how, to, he found that I was teaching him how to make pancakes. Why? Because I was converting the word battered from something terrible to yummy pancakes. And then after he talked about being a battered child, he grinned and it was a different valence for him. But the language is crucial. And you gotta be weird to make puns like a guano hold your hand. But I find it very helpful. So it's not easy. And it's also very difficult to figure this stuff out. But it's the beginning. If you can figure out how to help somebody open when everything wants to shut, you've started to antidote the stress response and give them something that would be both relaxing and functional. How does that sound? Sounds good. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the different ways in which people do stress? I'm 
know. I, I'm not, I've never thought about that in particular. I see they could have an accident, a car accident. Okay, they can respond to a million different things. But yeah, I'm, I'm not talking about, about I, I'm literally thinking, I was, Judith, I was thinking about how people do it in their bodies, whether, you know, there were, uh, I imagine there are very common traits, but I wondered actually if there's great variation in the way people do stress. Yes, there is in a way. Um, now you can have people say, I'm not angry. You can have people say, I'm not stressed. So are they, that's a little different issue. Um, mostly it's pretty similar. We are, we are very similar except in, in terms of our differences. And uh, I, I never really thought about the different ways people do stress. Is there, a kind of, is there a potential there for a sort of like a differential between flight and flight, fight and flight? So the flight is one of collapse and pretending you're not there. And the fight is to put up huge, great barriers around you and say, you can't really see it. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing my heading in here. No, not really. Because if you flee, you can be scared and tight and run as fast as you can. You can be angry. That's not a bitch. He's going to try to catch me. Or you can stand there and fight. And this is not going to work. But I'm going to try. So it's not the outward behavior, it's what you bring to it and how you do it on the inside that makes it there. Okay. But as we're always talking about the body, surely it's exhibited in, in how they use their body. Well, it isn't exhibited. That is how they use their body. It's not exhibited. It is the thing itself. And so if you use your body tightly, you can run, you can hide, you can, you can fight. If you use your body limply, you can still run, hide, or fight, or do anything you want. It'll just taste different because you're doing it differently. So I, I think what I'm after is a state in which the body is spacious on the inside and compassionate and aware. Let's see, how would you do all of that? How would you create compassion when you're, when you're doing stress? How would you replace stress with compassion? Uh, with gradual change, I imagine, small steps to get there. Yeah. What, and I, the steps I would use, I would start with something that makes me feel compassionate. Oh, look at that poor little mouse. He's so small. <laughs> and then I would work my way up to, oh, that poor cat had a mouse and now he doesn't have it. And I work yes, you should see his face. <laughs> you should see the way he's looking at us at the moment. He's being robbed. <laughs> And then I work my way up to the poor humans who have to watch this vicious animal <laughs> playing with another life. You see, start with something small and it won't blow somebody off the map, map. And then you work your way up. But what you have to do is find something to which they naturally respond with compassion and then get them to notice what they're doing. And then it's like weightlifting for the brain. You, you keep it going, you keep it getting stronger. And that is the point of Aikido for me. And I think for Quentin and for a number of us, it gives you the situation in which you can naturally identify your strategies of action and see whether they're compassionate, expansive, open, or whether they're small and separating, dehumanizing. So there has to be a great deal of empathy there, because I think compassion comes from empathy. I don't know. Maybe. Um, I don't think so. I think they can be different. They can be different. You can have compassion without empathizing, I think. Anybody else have any opinion? I, I think if I didn't understand the mouse's predicament, it would be hard for me to feel compassionate towards it. I don't know. You could say, I don't understand why that person is so upset about taking a test in front of an audience of 200,000. I don't know why. It doesn't bother me, but I sure do. I see that they're uncomfortable and I, I feel for them. Fair enough. See, what you're getting, unfortunately, is a philosophy major. And I was trained to go to the boundary conditions and look at the edges and then work my way in. So anything you say, I'll, I'll go to the boundary conditions and say, does that apply always? And if I can find something that doesn't, what I'm doing is trying to find a definition that we can all agree on that always applies, that's precise. Okay. But I am the word test, as I say. Paul, if you're talking about boundaries, then, I mean, looking at um, stress in, in things rather than human beings, a very typical 
aspect of the manufacturing process is to stress test. Yes, of course. So you carry on until it breaks. Mm -hmm. Yes. So some people do that to themselves in a way. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying uh, in any strange way, but but in in weight training or something, they'll they'll go on until they can't do it anymore. So they heard. So from stress testing, is that is there a role here in in what we're talking about today? Yes, there could be, I guess. Uh, that if people, yeah, I've I've had a number of clients who do to themselves what their abusers did to them as children, because that makes them okay in their abuser's eyes. They're trying to get to be okay. So now he knows that I agree with him and he won't do it to me again. So they take over the, the stress and do it to themselves. I don't think it's quite exactly what you meant, but yeah, no. people can do that kind of thing to themselves for various reasons. We're a strange species. Next time I invent the universe, I'm gonna change us. Rich, you wanted to say something? Yeah, well, just to just to jump off of what you were saying, it's, um, you know, we were talking about Aikido practice. And if we wanted to bring this whole conversation of stress into that, the practice could be used as a stress test or the work that, you know, we talked about last week or that Paul's talking about. If you wanted to use stress testing as this, this, this sort of idea, it's what we do to help people. You're, you're sort of pushing the boundaries uh, you know, of what they're, they're used to dealing with or that they have the tools or capability to deal with, you know, and then maybe letting them, you know, respond or react to that. And then all of a sudden you'll come back with a little deeper into it. Um, so I just wanted to kind of build off of what you were saying is, does this have any, any place in this? And I would say, yeah, there's a couple of places right there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I agree totally with you, Quentin and Rich as well. I'm not disagreeing with anybody. For once. But. I think that actually <laughs> it, it plays very nicely into the shoes point though about stress testing because actually that's almost what you're doing every time you grab a partner. Yeah. Seeing how, you know how much you should be giving them before they start to crack. Yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. it, it enables them to detect what their responses are. You're turning up the volume. Yeah. And that's brilliant as a, as a method. How many people think you should love your enemies? How many people find it and it means to practice loving? So I think that's Aikido. And what I'm trying to do is say it in different language so that people can be more precise and understand what they're trying to do. So if you glow, that makes the body more spacious. Can you turn the rheostat up and shine, not just glow? Can you be a, a, an arc welder? Art, whatever you call those things, that the brilliant bluish light. When you turn up the image of the light and make it go farther from your body, do you experience more spacious and more more something open? Okay, some people will, many people will. So what I'm doing is working my way up to Tohei Sensei's extend key, but I'm doing it slowly because I couldn't when I started. I didn't know what the hell it meant. So what else? You can be compassionate. When you're compassionate, when you feel for the other person, do you shrink away from them or do you open towards them? You tend to open. What else? You can breathe. You can practice breathing. There's a, there's a lot of different ways. What I'm trying to do is identify the commonality so it, it makes sense. They're not different ways. There are different paths to understanding how to bigify. And that is that, I think, is the crucial piece. So, Paul, some situations, let's say that you, you've got to give a big speech and you're terrified of speaking in public. Mm -hmm. I can see how you could prepare for that by doing some meditation, doing some yeah. breathing exercises, stuff like that, because you know it's going to happen. Um, what about those situations where, let's say, you're terrified of spiders and you walk around a corner and there's the biggest spider you've ever seen where you can't prepare? How do you... Uh, how do you um, coach the people in those sorts of situations I take them aside. there's no spider here she lob is waiting on the outside for us to finish but uh, you start where there is no problem and you manufacture a small problem the way the early physicists didn't investigate gravity by dropping things off towers they rolled balls on inclined planes which slowed the process down so they could study it 
So you can't, if you don't prepare, you'll be out of luck. And as you say, you can't prepare in the moment. So you have to prepare by practice over and over again when there is no problem. Then mm -hmm. if you're lucky, it'll happen and you'll do it right because you right. put it into your body. So it's and a that, different sort of preparation. It's not, it's just <laughs> you prepared the body not to react in the same way to that stimulus. No, you haven't. But Quentin, can, can I answer that? Yeah, in a different way. Hugh, yes. I'll answer in one way because this this is is a really good question I think you've asked and it's a recurring theme and my, my answer to it is you learn to breathe out so the rest of the world when they meet the big spider they breathe in they freeze the body weight rises yeah. but Aikidoka breathe out drop the center and relax Nice. Many years ago, I was teaching a course, in the, a graduate course at the university in the city where I live. And I had somebody in who was a bioenergetics practitioner, a form of psychotherapy. She had us walk around the room and it, without any warning, she and her two, two helpers had shouted, stop, at the top of their lungs. I relaxed, I dropped my shoulders and immediately turned toward the, the sound. I didn't mean to, it just happened. Everybody else except one other person did, went, <gasps> turned away from the sand and, and froze. The, the woman looked at the other person and said, do you teach Aikido too? He said, no, I teach karate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just to add, Quentin, Paul, yes. uh, the, the spider story. I mean, it's funny you should mention that because I've got an exact example of a spider story like this. It's when we went to Australia to visit Alex's brother who lives in Queensland, and we were out with his brother and our daughter out in the sort of bit of rainforest there. And we came around a corner and a huge web between trees. There's one of these massive golden orb spiders. It was huge. It's bigger than my hand. Absolutely enormous thing. So my daughter and myself were both arachnophobes. Alec isn't, yeah? So I sort of looked at it and went, yoikes, and then did the Aikido thing, which is what you've just discussed. So I didn't go anywhere or do anything. Our daughter nearly jumped out into the traffic, but got grabbed by uh, her uncle. So she didn't do that. So she had a, a classic stress, uh, stressing reaction to it. Right? But familiarity somehow helps you cope with that. Because less than a week later, we went out to Franklin Island on the Great Barrier Reef. And in the centre of that island, there was yet another golden orb spider in her web, yeah? But she wasn't as big as the first one, yeah? And our daughter stood in front of that web and looked, she looked at the second spider and she said, oh, it's not as big as the other one. And I thought, you've just put that spider right in its place, haven't you, madam? <laughs> but her reaction completely changed. I was thinking, I would, I would like to change one thought. You are not an arachnophobe. You do arachnophobia. <laughs> I, I, I do arachnophobia, yeah. And it's balanced head. with my sense of ethics because I never allow myself to hurt spiders because I recognised a long time ago that my reaction to them is not the spider's fault. Yeah, well, Rich, they, did you want to add something? Me do. Rich. Yeah, I, 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 I'm going to just keep adding on to what you says today. That's going to be my role today. Uh, because I love that breathing, that breathing out. But I do want to add one of the, the things that I think Paul's talking about now and where, where a lot of his work revolves around and an Aikido thing, and that's the blend of, of where his stuff came from, is you, your, your example, which is a beautiful one. I'm going to steal that if you, you're okay with it and, <laughs> and, and tell people about that, of breathing out. The next step that I think Aikido teaches and Paul's work teaches is, okay, we breathe out, but then that you're still sort of in that relaxed state of being run over by the train that Paul was saying. What I think Aikido and Paul's work teaches is not only expand, expand out, but enter in. You, it's, that, it's that, oh, okay, I'm centered, but then there's a power that I have to do something about it. Yeah. If I'm just centered and here, I'm still getting whacked. I'm still getting run over by the train. I'm still getting bitten by the spider. Yeah. It's that it's that exhale and <laughs> the power to do something next <laughs> and enter into it or, or make the response. Remember to give Hugh the credit, not me. Yeah. <laughs> did, I, did I say Quentin? You, I was <laughs> That's quite true. But, or and, sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. 
Mm -hmm. I can't cure my Parkinson's. So I just keep breathing. I'm, I stand there. At least I'll be happy when I'm hit by the train. <laughs> I would counter that though, Paul. And I would say you have accepted, you've accepted that you've had your Parkinson's and you do have your Parkinson's, but you have used the power to remain centered and continue to teach and settle your tremors. And those are the important ends. You could have just accepted it and sat in a chair and shaken. Yeah, right. No, I wouldn't do that. That wouldn't. No, happen. I know you wouldn't. But... <laughs> See, Quinn, this is why we argue back and forth. This is... Yeah, because <laughs> he makes me be precise. <laughs> I mean, Quentin, can I just add and, and pull one point that, uh, you know, actually David was talking about it earlier, about being comfortable, being relaxed in a, in a dojo setting. And indeed, for most of us, this is true. We go, we're going to a happy place when we go to the dojo. But another thing I've done, which I find quite an interesting exercise is to, and it happened to me once, so I do it to other people, even with a senior grade, put them up against the wall. Put them up against, back, back right up against the wall and attack them with a loud ki. And the reaction is quite, quite different because they're, they're suddenly out of their comfortable dojo environment and there's no there's nowhere to move to behind you but that's excellent if you if you train for it you move to the side and you slam exactly them into the wall. exactly exactly but but it catches people out so it's uh, the, the environment i think is is also key yes you're right one of the things that i've done that's very similar is i grab when i travel i go to a dojo i will take some yudancha and grab him by the hand or her and pull and say, don't let me pull you toward me. What do they do? They all resist. Yeah. Why not walk forward? Yeah. With all the lending that we've trained ourselves to do, we haven't taken it into our daily lives in a way that comes naturally to us. And so I, they hear me saying, don't come toward me. I didn't say that. I said, don't let me pull you forward. And that's very hard for them to understand until I emphasize pull. Then they get, it. it's, a, it's a trick. It's a riddle. It's the way we, and that's the same thing you're doing. You're saying when people haven't trained to internalize the state of being, they can't transfer it to some novel situation. Gordon, I want to pull you into the conversation here. So can you unmute? Yes, that was you. Yeah, good man. So you're regularly teaching breathing as part of your classes and deliberately trying to put people bodies under stress through breathing exercises. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, well, maybe at another time, I'd rather just do it with everybody and talk about it, but- That's all right. Well, we'll, 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 do, we'll, we'll deal with that another up, time. We do but have a session now, lined up in, in January to do just that, but do you want to just sort of give a summary of why you do that? Well, they stress themselves to whatever point they want to go. I don't put them under stress. I give them some breath exercises, which are usually combined with a simple movement. That's walking, could be that. And the point of that is that when we get stressed, the brain will take the oxygen from the muscles up to the brain, because that's the last thing that'll go. So what I'm asking them to do is to scan their system and feel what happens when the muscles start to weaken. What they'll discover is that even though the muscles are weakening, they can still function. So that helps to minute reduce the panic response. Right. So everything that we do, you know, following on really from Paul's work is done with the body. Right. But then they get to experience it for themselves. And that's the truth. It's not my truth. It's their truth. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. And part of those exercises, just to sort of make the point, is that you're asking them to hold their breath for increasingly longer periods, which stresses out and comes very nicely into Hugh's point about when they're allowed to breathe out, suddenly life gets a bit easier. Well, it is longer periods and it's also a sporadic. So, you know, they're, they're doing whatever they're doing, and I'll just say stop but I don't, they don't know when they're gonna be allowed to take the next breath. So that increases the panic response. So we're looking for that. And I tell them, you know, if you're feeling lightheaded, 
you know, you just back off. Don't, you know, you're not trying to prove anything to anybody but yourself. Right? Yeah. 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 So we just find using the breath, you can actually work longer. Yeah. Uh, and there's no, there's no real, you know, you do it enough times. There's, there's no real effort required. You just, you're just able to work longer and then you can make better choices. Brilliant. That sets us up nicely for January. Thank you very much. Back to you, Paul. Okay, so um, compassion. Let's try a, a, another exercise. When you breathe in and out, most people do both. Is there a change between the one direction and the other? Do you grip or loosen or do something different when you change directions of your breath? Most people do. What, what I'd like you to try, we'll do this quickly. When you change direction, tighten. So inhale, tighten, and then exhale, and tighten, and then inhale. Tighten just a bit for a second or two between the inhale and the exhale, the exhale and the inhale. I imagine that does not feel very comfortable. Can you let it go so there's no change? You don't breathe like a piston. Start breathing like a figure eight, gently with almost no sensation of changing direction. You just let everything inside your body soften. How, can you do that? And if so, how does that feel? Much more comfortable. Is it different from the way you normally breathe? For many people it is, and for some people it isn't. I think when you draw attention to the breath, I probably breathe in and out for longer. Mm -hmm. uh, but the feeling, in, and I've just become more aware of what I'm doing in my body as opposed to just letting yeah. it happen. Right. I find that when I, it, when I first started this, it was very strange to not hold my breath. And then I gradually became able to keep going. And that is the exercise that allowed me to start controlling my tremors. It's a smoothness, I call it seamless breathing. I'm sure other people have found it. I don't know what they call it, but okay, seamless breathing, compassion, um, bigifying, letting the tongue and the throat, everything in the core of your body drop. There's, there's a number of different things and we all do similar things, I think, but that is, one of that's a bunch of the, the exercises and techniques I use to teach people to relax and be ready to move next. People have been extremely traumatized. Mm -hmm. um, how much harder is it to get them to normalize again, to find and use the techniques effectively? It isn't hard. It just has to be gradual so it's safe. I don't jump on them the first day. I throw tissues at them. And that may be too much for some people. I have to build it up very gradually within the confines of the safety contract. They are in charge. I'm not. I won't do anything to, to them without telling them first. And as they get used to it, they will, they will actually do, do the whole sequence much faster than they would if they're going through verbal therapy or something because it works. I've had, I had one woman near, nearly kill me. It was, I did brilliantly, Kemi. I was perfect for two seconds, saved my life. And you should have seen her walk into the class the next week. She looked like a queen. It's like, nobody can give me shit, but I wouldn't <laughs> do that again. But, uh, so it can be very quick. If I could let them kill me, I'm sure it would be even quicker. But I couldn't do much afterwards. Does anyone want to ask any questions or offer any observations, make points? Do you agree with me? That's fair. Sure. I, I have a, a, a sort of a simple question. Um, you've, Paul, you've described uh, a, a sort of a play scenario of, you know, someone being sort of on the, the train tracks and you see the train and then they smallify. And then you've described a, a, a number of vehicles to transition from smallifying to uh, expanding, right? And so you described imagining that you're a candle, imagining that you're the butt of a firefly. I'm sure there are many others. Um, and how this is used to transition you towards a more expansive state where you can jump off the train tracks, yes. right? Uh, make the appropriate response. Right. Um, can, can you talk more about how um, in a more like long-term practice, 
how these sort of vehicles uh, play out? Because it seems to me that if I'm focusing on myself as a candle, at, at, a, at a very simple level, like I might be focusing so, you know, enough on myself as a candle that I'm kind of ignoring parts of the world and maybe yeah. I can still walk and chew bubble gum, but there's a part of me that's still focused on this image and not more naturally responding to the work. So could, could you talk a little bit about that? The, nothing stays still. The image that works one day won't, won't work the next day because you've used up that image and you need a new one. Mm -hmm. So if you're filling your car with oil, you don't keep pouring oil in when it's got enough. Yeah, you might have to fill the tires with air. So it, if you feel what's going on inside of you, you'll feel when one practice has run its course and another one will spring up. So I first started practicing just letting my weight down into the ground. Then as I walked around practicing that, when I was a baby, I guess, one day I thought, I wonder what would happen if I sent my weight up. And then after a while, I said, I wonder what would happen if I sent my weight in both directions. And that opened me up in a different way. And I said, well, if it's two directions, good. Four directions, better. And six directions, even better than that. And then after a while, I realized that I had lots of directions. I created a sphere. We have nothing to sphere, but the sphere itself. Somebody said that. Oh, <laughs> the <flat earth> <laughs> then after a while, I realized that the sphere had a, was dualistic, had an inside and an outside. So I took the skin off the sphere. Then I realized it still was dualistic. It had a center. So I got rid of the center. Then it was just an undifferentiated feeling of something with everything. See what I'm saying? At a certain point, it will change if you pay attention to it and let it. And I didn't know where I was going. I still don't know where I'm going. But I usually turn around when I get someplace and I say, oh, that's where I've come from. Sean, can I, I add a little bit to that? I think, you know, different pictures are appropriate for different situations. So, you know, maybe if you're feeling a bit depressed, thinking of yourself as a candle and light expanding out might be really, really helpful. But if I'm standing in front of somebody who's got a sword, I might want a different image. I might want to see them as a, a light and me as a light and as a big sphere of light between them. I don't know what the picture might be, but I have a different image. Go on, come so, back. Yeah, so I, I completely understand that the image might change day to day, situation to situation. My question is more about the quality of relying on an image. It's not an image. By I'm itself. Not relying on it. no, I'm not right. relying on the image. It's just a way of tricking the body into assuming a, a, a behavior that I can't get to directly. I think Paul would say he's got many, well, I'll say for Paul, he's got many tools in his kit bag. So it might not be an image. It might be breathing he's focusing on or or some exercise to do with centering or grounding or 101 other things that no doubt he uses. It just depends what, what, what which tool, which, is it a hammer or a saw he needs today? Paul, Richard. Sorry about that. Um, another part of this that I want to, I think you're getting at, Sean, is when we're showing people all of these different tools, a lot of people say this is your continuum of, of life's going around here and event happens, right? And you're suggesting, okay, when I'm all the way up here and I'm stressed, oh, I think candle, right? Okay. Rewind back and you're just tooling around life. What we're doing here in all of Quentin's, you know, these talks and Paul's exercises is like an Aikido practice, okay? This is the playground. The playground is the expanding out and taking the time to think of a candle or any one of these tools. But that's not how you're going to do that in real life. The, the practice, just like Aikido practice, we do moves that would be completely useless in the real world. We're learning a principle. Okay, this practice of glowing out, the real goal of that is to get you to a state where you can respond correctly. It's after, it's that state that we achieve after this practice. Okay, so in the real world, while you're tooling across, I would hope in Aikido or anything that Paul's suggesting is that you've practiced, practiced, practiced. So you can very quickly and easily when this is even starting to go up here, 
you don't you don't have the time to all of a sudden go hang on let me relax my tongue let me expand out let me do all this stuff up oh, the trains already run me over but just in that split second if you've practiced all these things you just think either tongue go or maybe you've practiced it enough where you know how to access this state that all of these things help us get to not only recognize but attain where as soon as this starts ramping up, you know how to get to that state. So you're not going to think, oh, expand out, oh, do these tools. These are just pathways to get to that state. That's the split second thing. Does that? That, that, that gets to the heart of my question is okay. like, I understand them. I, I, I completely understand them as sort of vehicles to get to that state. Right. And what I'm curious about the heart of my question is about the relationship to sort of okay once you're in that state then your your sort of continued relationship to that vehicle say right do you continue to think about candles or do you just drop the candle and and like and just candle doesn't like, matter it's the state that state right the candle I mean, doesn't have anything to do with it the candle was just teaching you how to get to that state yeah well yeah, yeah. I, I mean this this is i this is I what I was guessing, but it was not addressed earlier, at least not that I could hear. Right. So I was no, sort of thank curious. you, Sean. Good contribution. Renata, did you want to say something? We can't hear you, unfortunately. You need to turn now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yay! <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having the control over my volume. I'm sorry. Um, okay. when, when practicing, I still, I really use these images or I've got, uh, I've got two of them. I use them a lot, but I recognize that I know the, the, the goal kind of, and it's in me. I don't even know it with my head. I know it with my, actually with my exhale. I know it with my breath, which is with me anyway. Thank goodness. And when somebody or something is really um, getting me to, um, yeah, to want to smallify or to to get a distress response and and get stressing, with the next exhale, I will do it without thinking of any shining. Not that strong, but then I recognize I'm doing it, and then I can use an image to light it up kind of to strengthen it yeah. more right. so you've got to that's the way where, where it has grown with me yeah you've acquired the ability to just flick that switch and use yeah. that tool when you need it yeah uh, quentin Liz. just going back to the very beginning you were asking us to define you know whether we thought stress was positive or negative and a lot of us said both and in my experience, they, they, it really is both. So there's positive and negative stresses and there's different ways of reacting and dealing with them from our training. And so, so we talked a lot about negative stress, ne ne negative stressing, be careful language I'm using now. But with the positive stressing, um, I found that you can sort of, uh, once you accept a positive stress, and you work with your body's reaction. So you get stress and you get that um, adrenaline burn, as I call it, which is what kicks in, isn't it? And that not puts your performance up several gears. It gives you great clarity of mind because your mind is very focused at that point because that's the effect it has. And with negative stresses, it, that can be the exclusion of everything else. And then you're in a downward spiral. But when you've got that positive stress, it's positive stressing, and you've got that uh, adrenaline burn, you've got that clarity of mind, that's what immediately precedes your highest ever performances that I've found professionally or on the Aikido mat or anywhere else. But you have to work with that stress process to, to really get that top performance. Yeah, I, I guess it's about recognize, gosh, there's adrenaline going through my system now, how can I use that fuel mm -hmm. to give yeah. me a better performance? So, um, yeah, uh, you can get very positive results, I agree. It reminds me of uh, those old valves you used to get in a radio. You know, if it's not switched on, there's no light, nothing happens, you can't hear it. And they've got to kind of light up to an optimum level before you can actually get sound. Push it too far, they pop. 
that kind of a bit like stress, isn't it? We kind of need a bit, a little bit of stuff going on in our lives to get out of bed and crack on with the day. Uh, and sometimes we get pushed a little bit further than that. But, and again, it's about expanding boundaries, I guess, to be able to cope with bigger and bigger influxes. Paul, over to you. Any uh, I, final conclusions? Yes, the same conclusion I, I voiced a couple of times ago. Life is a good news, bad news joke. The good news <laughs> is through pain and suffering, we gain wisdom. The bad news is that there's, there's more good news coming. <laughs> <laughs> I love your jokes. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that too. Uh, John, I'm that. thinking of you. Is, have you got a song to offer us this week to close out? Um, no? Yeah, actually, I've become a bit of an expert in stress management. Uh, I've been married three times. That'll do it. <laughs> so there. There's some profound wisdom in there somewhere, John, I'm sure. <laughs> Quentin, I think uh, in terms of signing out, we need to know how the auction went. <laughs> Charlie, you better report back. Did he make a fortune? <laughs> yes. Are you going to build a new dojo? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was... It was Pretty good. But the first picture, we still waited for the second one. The first went for five, 550 pounds, and the other we are estimated going to be about a thousand or more. So, mm -hmm. fantastic. Well done. So, this is his Russian son exporting work to the UK where he gets paid properly for it because they wouldn't get paid that in Russia, that's for sure. Um, okay, I think this is a brilliant point to sort of probably draw a conclusion for this week. Next week uh, is the third part with Mary Heine Sensei. Uh, so we'll finish off her story and, and, and maybe get a bit of a message of hope for Christmas, because that will be our final session before Christmas and we'll start up again in the new year. So I'm going to have two weeks off if that's okay. I've got to be, I'm going to help Santa or something like that. Um, so I thought it might be quite nice as it is the last session before Christmas. Bring along your gin and tonic or your pint of beer or a glass of red wine <laughs> or something. I'll warn Mary that that's what we're doing and um, we can relax into Christmas that way. Or bring your bottle if you like. Bring the whole bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and everybody who contributed today. Um, you, you're a great lot and uh, I hope it was useful for you. Thank you so much for allowing yeah. me. Mm -hmm. with you. I really appreciate it. It's nice. I like you guys. <laughs> we quite like you too, Paul. Only cool. Thank you very much, Paul and everybody. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Have a good week, Thank everybody. You. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.